Chapter 22 of Buffalo Bill and the Overland Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Buffalo Bill and the Overland Trail by Edwin L. Sabin. Carrying the Great News. Lincoln's elected. The words continued to ring in Davy's ears, and the flying shape of the Pony Express, bearing the great news, was constantly in his eyes as at a trot and gallop the stage rolled along the Salt Lake Overland Trail from Fort Lamoury on. Irish Tom and his hard-pushed pony were out of sight, and they were not forgotten. The trail was almost deserted this morning. Only one emigrant train was passed, and drawing aside to let the stage by, it cheered to the three persons on the box. Hooray for Lincoln! Davy cheered back, but Gentleman Bob and Messenger Mayfield looked straight ahead and said nothing. That was the fashion. Emigrant trains and bull trains were considered beneath the notice of the stagecoach box. However, in another mile something did attract the notice of Gentleman Bob, whose eyes were ever on the lookout, although he usually spoke little. Looks like trouble yonder, he remarked, pointing with his whip. How's your gun, Jack? Okay? Yes. Better have it ready. Red, you get down in the boot under the seat and stay there. When I say so, you're liable to be shot full of holes. Bob gathered his lines tighter and peered keenly. His jaw set as holding up his mules prepared for a sudden dash he sent them forward at a brisk trot. Messenger Mayfield shifted his short double-barreled gun, loaded with buckshot from between his knees to his lap, and pulled down his hat. Half a mile before, in the hollow of the sweeping curve which the coach was rounding, was a riderless horse moving restlessly hither-tither in the brush beside the trail. He was equipped with saddle and bridle, at least so Bob muttered, and so the messenger agreed, and so Davy believed that he also could see, but of the rider there was no sign yet. Indians! Then why hadn't they taken the horse, or road agents, as the bandits were called? The rider must have been shot from the saddle. And would the coach passing find him, or were the Indians surprised in the act, ambushed and waiting? Or what had happened anyway? That's the Pony Express horse, gentlemen, said Bob quietly. I know the animal. There's been bad work. Mr. Mayfield, who was as nervy as Bob himself, nodded. Davy breathed faster, his heart beating loudly. Bob flung his lash, straightened out his team, and with brakes slightly grinding descended the hill at a gallop. I see him, exclaimed Messenger Mayfield. At the edge of the road, he's hurt, but he can move. Davy, too, could see a dismounted man, Irish Tom, or somebody else, half raising himself from the ground and crawling into the trail, where he sat waving his handkerchief. With rattle and shuffle and grinding of brake, the coach bore down, prepared to stop and prepared for anything else that might befall. Yes, it was Irish Tom, the Pony Express rider, and that was his horse the saddlebag still on it, fidgeting in the brush. Tom was half lying, half sitting, supporting himself with one arm and waving with the other. His hat was gone, his uplifted hand bleeding, one leg seemed useless, and altogether he appeared in a sad state. In a cloud of dust from braced hoofs and unlocked wheels, Gentleman Bob halted with the leader's forehoofs, almost touching Tom. What's the matter here? Tom's face, grimy and streaked and pinched with pain, gazed up agonizedly, and he did not mince his words. The Pony Express rider was superior even to a stage driver. Catch that horse for me, I've broken my leg. Down from the box nimbly swung Mr. Mayfield, jamming his brakes tighter and tying the line short. Down swung Gentleman Bob, down clambered Dave. How did it happen? Fell and threw me. Catch him and help me on and hurry up. Catch him, Jack, you and Dave, 
bade Bob crisply. Where is it broken, Tom? High up, but that doesn't matter. I'll ride if it kills me. I'm late now. Luckily, the horse was easily caught. His dragging lines entangled in a sage clump held him until Mr. Mayfield laid hand upon them. When Dave, with Mr. Mayfield leading the horse, returned into the road and hustled back to Bob and Tom, Bob was arguing tensely. But you can't, Tom. You can't do it, man. You can't fork a saddle with your hip broken. Tom struggled to sit up, and the great beads of sweat stood on his red brow. You help me on and tie me there. That's all I ask. I'll make it. I've got to. We'll take you on to the next station, and the saddlebags too, retorted Bob. That's the quickest way. Strip that horse red. Give me a lift with Tom here, Jack. Open the coach door. But there's nobody except the agent at the next station, Bob, appealed Tom wildly. Who'll take the express? Then we'll go through to the next station. They can send somebody from there, I reckon. Suddenly, a great thought struck Davy, and he wondered why the same hadn't occurred to the others. I'll ride it, Tom. I'll ride it, Bob. Let me. And he sprang for the express pony. Bob slapped his dusty thigh. The idea struck him. Go it, he exclaimed. Take those lines and buckle your guns, Tom, old man, while I hold you. Somebody put my spurs on him, panted Tom, tugging at his belt buckle. Words had been rapid, fingers worked fast, and almost in less time than it takes to tell it, after the halting of the coach, Davy was in the Pony Express saddle with the final orders filling his ears. Now ride, boy, ride! Scarcely yet settled into the stirrups, he bounded forward. The jerk of the meddlesome pony almost snapped his head loose, and was away. Ride, boy, ride! Davy jammed tighter his hat, his feet clinging to the stirrups. He half turned in the saddle and waved his hand to the little group behind. They would see that he was all right. They were grouped just as he had left them. Mr. Mayfield standing where he had strapped the spurs to Davy's heels after David mounted, Gentleman Bob half erect over Tom, from whom he had passed the revolver belt. But even as Davy looked, they all moved, preparing to lift Tom into the coach. Davy faced ahead and settled into his work. Ride, boy, ride! Well, he could ride. He knew how and if he didn't know how, he was bound to stick, anyway. There, where the plump saddlebags under him crossed by his legs, he was carrying the fast mail, and Lincoln was elected. The pony ran without a break, and needed no urging. He was trained to his work, a staunch, swift, apparently tireless animal. The wind smote Davy in the face. Bringing water to his eyes, the sandy, beaten trail flowed backward beneath them, like a dun torrent. The sage and rocks reeled dizzily, passed on either hand, and amidst the rhythmic beat of hoofs, the pony's breaths rose to snorty grunts. Now, another emigrant train for Salt Lake City and the Mormon colony dotted the trail before. Past them thudded Dave, as he raced down the line, he yelled shrilly, Lincoln's elected! Lincoln's elected! For how much? New York gives him 50,000! Dave was not certain what this conveyed exactly, but it had sounded important from Irish Tom. Some of the train cheered, some growled, but he speedily left both cheers and growls behind him. The first of the train stations appeared ahead, a blot of darker drab beside the trail. This was one of the way stations, the stations where horses were changed in less than two minutes. Two minutes was the limit. Frequently the change was made in fifteen seconds. Dave's pony seemed to know where he was and what was at hand. He snorted and at a pick of spur let himself out a little longer in his stride and doubled and stretched a little faster. The station was swiftly enlarged. A poor place it was, Dave remembered. A low log cabin, sod roofed with rude log stable close behind it, and a pole corral. 
The station man would be about as rude in appearance, unshaven, well-weathered, dressed in slouch hat, rough flannel shirt, red or blue, belted trousers and heavy boots. There he lived by the roadside, 700 miles into the Indian country, alone amidst the unpeopled, rolling sagey hills through which flowed the North Platte River, and extended, unending the ribbon-like road. Dave could see him standing in front of the buildings, holding the relay horse and peering down the trail for its rider. The stations were required by the company to have the fresh horse saddled and bridled and ready half an hour before the express was due. Dave knew his duty too. Not slackening pace, he loosened from the fastenings the saddlebags under him. Up at full gallop he dashed, and even before he had pulled his pony to its haunches, he tore the saddlebags from beneath him and tossed them ahead. Then he was off in a twinkling, staggering as he landed. Quick, he gasped out of parched throat. The station man had stared, but he grabbed the saddlebags. Who are you? Where's Tom? Hurt, coming on stage. The saddlebags were clapped on the other saddle. Dave grasped the bridle lines. Bad? Leg broken. And Davy, thrusting foot into stirrup, vaulted aboard almost over the station man's head. One last twitch to the saddlebags. What's the news? Lincoln's elected. New York gives him 50,000 majority. And away sprang Dave, headlong on the next leg of his route. Thudding through the sand, clattering over the rocks, echoing through short defiles, ever urging his pony, rode Davy. He was resolved to go clear through to the home station at Red Buttes, over sixty miles. The stations ahead had no means of knowing that any accident had befallen the regular rider, and to mount another substitute at short notice would consume valuable time. At Red Buttes, Bill Cody would take the saddlebags, and to give them to Billy he must. At the next station, fourteen miles, the station man had helpers in the shape of two hostlers, or stable hands. They also gazed astonished at the sight of Dave instead of Irish Tom. But no one wasted precious moments in explanations. The conversation was much the same as before, and on his fresh horse Dave spurred again up the long, long trail. He passed the toiling bull train. Lincoln's elected, he shrieked as before. But he was going so fast that he did not catch their response. He only noted them wave their hips in salute. Horseshoe Station hove into view. This was headquarters station for the division. Here stayed, when not on the trail, Mr. Slade, the division superintendent, and he was in front of the station cabin with the other men peering down the road. Davy galloped in. He was assailed by a volley of queries, until Mr. Slade cut them short. No matter, he bade curtly. Fasten that machilla, now ride, my lad, you're half an hour late. Lincoln's elected, gasped Davy, spurring away. He was getting tired. His feet were growing numb, and his ankles were being chafed raw. Before he arrived at the next station, the Platte River had to be forded. As he passed through, a man sprang into sight, in the trail at the farther bank. Dave's heart leapt into his throat. The man was partially screened by willows. He was armed. With ears pricked, the horse forged ahead, and the man waited. To leave the stream bed required a little climb up the rather steep bank, and as Dave reached it, out whipped the man's revolver, and the muzzle was trained true at Dave. It seemed to him that the round hole covered every inch of his body. His horse shied and balked. Throw off the mailbag! The man was Yank, assistant wagon boss, under Charlie Martin. Dave recognized him at once although the slouch hat was pulled low. But beneath the brim the eyes were those of Yank. No, panted Dave, trying to hold his voice steady and think of what Billy Cody or Irish Tom would do. 
It's only election news. Throw off the mail bag and be quick, too, ordered Yank with a string of curses. Hardly knowing what he did, but resolved to do something, Dave plunged his spurs into his pony's heaving flanks. With a great snort and a long leap, the pony lunged forward straight up the bank. Yank uttered a sudden vicious exclamation and dived aside, but the horse's shoulder struck him, hurled him aside, and at the instant veering sharply into the fringe of willows, Dave sent his mount crashing through. The willow slapped him in the face and on the body. He bent low. In a moment more they were out of the willows, again into the trail, and tearing onward. He heard a shot, just one, but the bullet went wide, and thuddity thuddity, he was galloping safe. A little shaky, Dave laughed. He felt like giving a whoop, although he could not spare breath for even that. He imagined, though, how mad Yank must be, and this was what made him laugh. Even with the excitement of the hold-up that failed, the road began to seem wearisome, the ride one monotonous pound. The chafing stirrups tortured his ankles almost beyond endurance, but not quite, no, not quite. The saddle chafed his thighs. His mouth was parched. He could scarcely breathe. He could scarcely see. When, ever and anon, his head swam giddily. He forded the river again. From throbbing pain, his ankles changed to the relief of numbness, and his feet blistered and his blistered thighs gradually ceased to be his. They felt as if they belonged to somebody else. He had vague recollection of arriving at the way stations, of staggering from horse to horse, of being helped into the saddle, of voices hailing him, and hands and voices forwarding him on again. Once he passed the eastbound stage, and again he passed it, or another, and he piped to the staring faces, Lincoln's elected! New York gives 50,000 majority! The words issued mechanically, and he did not know what effect they had. He had vague recollection that a bevy of Indians yelled at him and flourished their bows, and that he heard the hiss of arrows travelling even faster than he, but he could not stop to argue. The one fact that stuck in his mind was that he was nearly on time. Three minutes late, he thought that somebody sat at the last station where he changed horses, and, Go it, lad! You're a plucky one. Three minutes late was all. The thought buoyed him up and glued him to his saddle. Gallop, gallop over rock and sand, through brush and through the bare open and through occasionally scrubby growth of trees, through shaded canyons and through the burning, windy sunshine. Was that Red Buttes? Was that really Red Buttes at last? The end of his trip? Where awaited Billy Cody? Supposing Billy wasn't there, would he want him to continue riding, riding forever? He uttered a little sob of despair, but he set his teeth hard and resolved that he'd do it. He'd do it if he had to. The road was hilly and his horse flagged. He spurred ruthlessly and struck with his hat. If he did not arrive on time, he would be ashamed for nobody could know how hard he had tried. Up the hill, he forced his pony and would not let him relax into a trot. Down the grade, he galloped, every forward jump a torment. Red Buttes, that must be Red Buttes, wavered strangely amidst the level expanse before. But he reached it, at last. At least he thought he reached it and he fumbled at his solo bags to loosen them. Somebody rushed forward as if to meet him and help him, and he saw, lying plainly amidst the confused other countenances and figures, the astonished face of Billy. It's red! Look out! You'll fall off! Billy's voice rang like a trumpet. Where's the regular man? they demanded. Tom's hurt, away back. I took his place. Quick, Billy, go on. Election news. 
Lincoln's elected. Billy vented an exclamation. He was into the saddle atop the saddlebags. He sprang away. Take good care of that kid, he called back. He's a good one. You bet we will. Am I on time? wheezed Davy, vaguely unable to see straight. Two minutes ahead of time, lad. Then they picked up Davy and carried him in, for he had fallen. He felt that he was entitled to fall. Besides, he could not have walked to save his life now that he was done with the saddlebags. End of chapter 22「23 of Buffalo Bill and the Overland Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Buffalo Bill and the Overland Trail by Edwin L. Saban. A Brush on the Overland Stage. Davy was so stiff and sore that for several days he moved around very little, but he learned that the news which he had brought in was being rushed westward at a tremendous rate. Billy Cody had ridden the last ten miles of his own run in thirty minutes, and by special rider from Julesburg, the tidings, Lincoln's elected, had been taken into Denver only two days and twenty-one hours out of St. Joseph. 665 miles. When Davy was on his way back to Laramie, he heard at Horseshoe Station that the news had been carried through to California in eight days, two days less than schedule. That was riding, and although he never again was on Pony Express, he felt that to the end of his life he would be proud of having ridden it once and of having performed well. The people at Fort Laramie appreciated what davy had done and if he had not been a sensible boy the praise that he got would have turned his head captain brown it was who summoned him over to the brown quarters one evening and asked flatly dave how would you like to go to west point and be educated for a soldier dave gulped in surprise and blushed red such an education had been beyond his dreams you have the right stuff in you, boy, continued the captain, eyeing him. You've made a good start, but you can't continue knocking around this way. The frontier won't last forever. When the telegraph comes through connecting the west with the east, the Pony Express will have to quit, and there'll soon be a railroad, and then the stagecoach business will have to quit. If we have war, and things look like it, I'll be ordered out. So will the other officers and men here, and what will happen to you is a problem. See, if you want to go to West Point, you ought to begin preparing so as to be ready when you're old enough to enter. It's no easy matter to take the course at the academy, but it's the finest education in the world, even if you don't stay in the army. I don't want you to go there with the idea of being a fighting man. Army officers are the last persons of all to wish for fighting. The Army has a great work to do outside of war. We're supposed to civilize the country and keep it peaceful. At West Point, your body is built up, and what you learn, you learn thoroughly. You come out fit to meet every kind of emergency. What do you say? If you say yes, then I'll make application to you to the president direct and ask him to appoint you at large as he has a right to do just as if you were my own son y yes sir stammered davy red i'd like to go good exclaimed the captain shaking with him i'll make arrangements so that if i'm ordered out you'll be in the right hands events seem to occur fast by Pony Express dispatches and the tissue newspapers, it was learned that South Carolina had withdrawn from the Union and that the other southern states were following suit. Abraham Lincoln, in his inauguration address, besought peace, but stood firmly for a United States. His address was carried from St. Joseph to Sacramento, 1,966 miles in seven days and 17 hours a new record. 
but when arrived the word that on April 12, the South Carolina troops had bombarded Fort Sumter, then everybody knew that the war had begun. Another important thing also occurred. Before spring, a stranger who created considerable talk came through by stage bound west. He was Edward Creighton, a pleasant gentleman with an Irish face and was on his way to Salt Lake looking over the country with a view to putting in a telegraph line through to Salt Lake City. A California company was to build from California East to Salt Lake, and it was rumored that the government offered a payment of $40,000 a year to the company that reached Salt Lake the first. This meant, of course, a line clear across from the Missouri to the Pacific coast. In the hurly-burly of troops preparing to leave for the front in the east, Davy had the idea that he too should go as a drummer boy, maybe. The sight of Billy Cody hurrying through was hard to bear. Billy appeared unexpectedly on the stage from Horseshoe Station, where he had been an extra rider under direct orders of Superintendent Jack Slade himself. Hello, Billy. Hello, Dave. Where are you going now, Billy? Back home. I haven't been home for a year, and my mother wants to see me. She's poorly again. I guess I'd better be where things are boiling, too. This war won't last more than six months, they say. But Kansas is liable to be a hot place with so many Southerners just across the border in Missouri. I ought to be on hand in case of trouble around home. I was just like Billy, to be on hand. Dave had more than half a mind to accompany him to Leavenworth, and Captain Brown, about to leave himself, had about decided that Leavenworth would be the best place when the matter was solved by the appearance of the Reverend Mr. Baxter, who arrived on the next stage from the west. Gee, Willikins, exclaimed Dave, overjoyed rushing to meet him. What are you doing here? I'm merely coming through on my way from Salt Lake back to Denver, laughed Mr. Baxter. I'm messenger on the stage between Julesburg and Denver, but I've been off on a little vacation with the survey party for a new stage road. I heard you were here. You're celebrated since you made that splendid ride, Davy. Davy blushed again. He hated to blush, but he had to. What are you doing these days, demanded Mr. Baxter. As soon as he heard of Davy's plans and present fix, he insisted that Davy travel down to Denver with him and stay there. Room with me, Dave? He proffered generously. I need a bunkie. You can get work easy enough. I know the very place where they can use a boy who can write and figure, and I'll tutor you. It will do me good to brush up a little in mathematics and all that. Captain Brown agreed, and the matter was promptly settled. Away went Dave, and the next day, Captain Brown himself left for Fort Leavenworth. And then, where? His going would have made Laramie rather empty for Dave. Denver had grown amazingly. There was now no area. All was Denver City. And what had been known as Western Kansas and the territory of Jefferson was the territory of Colorado. On both sides of Cherry Creek, many new buildings, two and three stories, some of the buildings being brick, had gone up. Potatoes and other produce were being raised, and the streets, busier than ever, were thronged with merchants and other real citizens, as well as with miners and bullwhackers. Mr. Baxter took Davy over to see the lots that they had bought through the sack of flour two years before. Then the lots had been out on the very edge of town. Now they were right in the business district. The Jones family had not cared for them, had sold them for a mere song, and had pushed on to get rich quick mining. The Joneses had gone back to the States, poor, but the lost lots were being held by the present owners at a thousand dollars apiece. Mr. Baxter made good his promise, and they found a niche which appeared to have been made especially for a red-headed boy with spunk who could read and write as well as take care of himself on the trail in the elephant corral. This was a large stone building and yard for the convenience of merchants and overland traffic. It dealt in flour and feed and other staples consigned to it and was headquarters for bull outfits arriving and leaving. The war excitement continued 
Colorado, like Kansas and Nebraska, sent out its volunteers in response to the calls of President Lincoln. Mr. Baxter tried hard to be accepted as a chaplain, but the examining surgeons refused him. He confided to Davy because he had a bum lung. So, Davy boy, he said, you and I will have to fight the battle of peace and win our honors there at present. They heard that Captain Brown had made a general, and Billy Cody and Wild Bill, too, were serving on the Union side as scouts and dispatch bearers in Kansas and Missouri. As for Davy, he pegged along, rooming and boarding with Mr. Baxter, doing his work at the Elephant Corral and studying evenings. Meanwhile, the staging and freighting across the plains and to Salt Lake continued, when not interrupted by the Indians. The Butterfield Southern Overland through Texas and New Mexico and Arizona to California, which had been carrying the government mail for two years, had to be discontinued on account of the war and the Apache Indians, and the contract was given to the Central Route, operated by Russell, Majors, and Waddell. This meant $400,000 a year from the government, and it looked as though the Central Overland, California, and Pikes Peak need no longer be called to clean out of cash and poor pay but soon the word came that the whole line had been bought in by a big creditor ben holliday great things were expected of ben holliday dave had seen him once or twice a large heavy man with square resolute face clean-shaven cheeks and gray beard he was a veteran trader and trader on the plains and had been in business in salt lake california st louis and New York, and was a hustler. He hastened to increase the service of his stage line. No expense or trouble was too much for him. The line was known now as Ben Holiday's line and the Overland Stage. The old route north from Julesburg and around by Fort Laramie was changed to a shorter route, the route which Mr. Baxter had helped survey for Russell Majors and Waddell at the time when he picked up Dave at Laramie which from Latham, 60 miles north of Denver, fearing northwest, crossed the mountains at Bridger's Pass for Salt Lake. At Salt Lake, the celebrated Pioneer Stage Line continued with passengers and mail and express for Placerville, California. The very fall after Dave arrived in Denver, Mr. Creighton finished his telegraph line into Salt Lake City and won the $40,000 a year prize offered by the government. California Company met him there. The first message was flashed through from coast to coast. The Pacific to the Atlantic sends greeting, it said, and may both oceans be dry before the foot of all the land that lies between shall belong to any other than a united country. And as Captain Brown had predicted, the Pony Express must stop. The holiday stages carried the mails. Every morning at 8 o'clock sharp, they left Atkinson below St. Joseph on the Missouri River at Latham. The Salt Lake coaches proceeded on to Salt Lake, and the Denver coaches turned south to Denver and usually got in with such regularity that Denver people set their watches by them. There never had been such a stagecoach magnet as Ben Holiday. His six and nine passenger Concord coaches were the best that could be built, and on the main line alone, he used 100. His horses were the best that could be bought, and of these and the mules he had on the main line, 3,000. His drivers were paid the best salaries, $125 and $150 a month, and for carrying the mails, he received from the government $650,000 a year. When several times a year he went over his whole lines, he traveled like a whirlwind and caused a tremendous commotion. But speedily the regular operation of the Holiday Overland Express was badly interrupted, for the Indians began to ravage up and down. All the way from central Kansas to the mountains, they destroyed stations and attacked stages. The stages ran two at a time for company and were protected by squads of soldiers, but even then they did not always get through, and Denver was cut off from the outside world for weeks at a time. 
Whenever Mr. Baxter started out as messenger, Dave was afraid that he would not come back alive, but somehow he managed to make the trip, although he was apt to return in a coach riddled with arrows and bullets. The summer of 1864, when Davy was almost 17 and old enough to enter the military academy, was the worst season of all for Indian raids. Stations and ranches for hundreds of miles at a stretch were pillaged, and the stages ceased altogether between the mountains and the Missouri. Then, in the fall, there came a law, of which Dave was heartily glad, for he had been ordered to report at Fort Leavenworth for examination. His appointment had come, signed by Abraham Lincoln. I'll see you through to Atchison, Dave, said Mr. Baxter, and to Leavenworth, too. The return trip will be my last run. Why so, Ben? asked Davy, astonished. Because I'm going to change to a permanent business while I can. The railways are coming. The Central Pacific's building a little every year east out of California, and as soon as the war is over, the Union Pacific will start from its end at the Missouri. When the two roads meet with trains running across the continent, this staging business will be knocked flat, and we messengers will be stranded. I've got my health now. I'm as good a man as anybody, and when I get back from Atchison, I'll go into something different. I've several offers pending, see? That sounded like sense, but Dave was pleased that Mr. Baxter had not quit before this trip, for he had counted on going out in Ben's coach. The fare from Denver to the Missouri River was up to $175, but Davy had saved this and more. The stages left from the planter's hotel. The first stage out after the long interruption created much excitement. At least 50 passengers clamored for places, but there was room for only nine in the body, and even they were crowded by mail sacks. Dave sat on the driver's box with Ben and the driver who was Bob Hodge. Everybody on the line knew Bob Hodge. He was one of the king whips and very popular. The holiday stage drivers out of the principal stations dressed the best that they could, for they were persons of consequence. Polished boots, broad cloth trousers tucked in, soft silk shirts with diamond stud, rakish hat, and kid gloves were none too good for them. Bob wore a suit of buckskin with its decorations of beads and fringes, the finest suit in Denver. As he stepped from the hotel, he elegantly drew on a pair of new yellow kid gloves. He nodded to Ben and Dave and tucked a brass horn, which was his pride, in the seat. On this horn, he was accustomed to perform when he wanted amusement and when he approached stations. His other pride was his whip of ebony handle inlaid with silver. All the holiday stage drivers owned their whips and would not lend them. Bob climbed aboard. Ben and Dave followed. Two hostlers held the six-horse team by the bits. Another handed up the lines to Bob, who condescended to receive them. Think she'll get through, Bob? queried several voices, referring to the coach. Oh, I reckon. She's been through several times before, drawled Bob. And by the looks of her, she evidently had been through something. It had been a beautiful coach in the beginning, painted a glossy bright green trimmed with gilt, but now it was scarred by storm and Indians. The very boot curtain behind Dave's feet was punctured in two places by arrows, and there were other holes through the coach sides. Bob glanced at his gold watch. He grasped lines and whip, nodded at the hustlers. They sprang from the leader's bits, released the heavy brake with a bang to the crack of his whip, forward leaped the six gray horses whose harness was adorned with ivory rings. The watching crowd gave a cheer, and driving with one hand, Bob played what he called into the wilderness. Bob's run was only to Latham, sixty miles down the plat. Here he descended in lordly fashion from his seat, and out of the coach must issue the passengers, much to their disgust. The mails from the West had been piling up for six weeks and were of more importance than people. 
41 sacks were stored aboard by the station agent until the coach was heaped to the roof, and the big boot was overflowing. The coach now carried a ton of mail and Ben, Davy, and the driver. Express messengers rode an entire division, such as between Atchison and Denver, between Denver and Salt Lake, and between Salt Lake and Placerville of California. So Ben continued on with Dave as his guest. The new driver was Long Slim, another odd character. Long Slim was six feet three inches tall and so thin that he claimed when he stood sideways he wouldn't cast a shadow. He was much different from dandy Bob Hodge, for he wore cowhide boots, a blue army overcoat, and a buffalo fur cap. Long Slim drove to Bijou Station, and here another driver took charge. Stage drivers drove 40 or 50 miles, or from home station to home station. In between, about every 10 miles were the swing stations, where the teams were changed. Meals were served at the home stations. The change of drivers was interesting and really made little difference today, for none of them talked much, and as the coach rolled further eastward into the Indian country, the talk was less and less. At the swing stations, the teams were always standing harnessed and waiting. The driver grandly tossed down the lines and yawned. The old team was whisked out in a jiffy. The new team trotted into place without being told. The station men handed up the lines to the box, and away went the stage again. At the home stations, the driver, Long Slim, or Deacon, or Dad, or Mizu, or whatever he was called, followed his lines to the ground, said, if he chose, All quiet so far, Hank and strolled into the station. If he mentioned a drink of water, half the station force rushed to get it for him. He was the king, was the driver on the overland stage. At Bijou Station, six soldiers of the Colorado Cavalry picked up the stage and escorted it, riding three on a side for about a hundred miles. At least they were there when Davy peeked out of the boot under the driver's seat where he slept, curled in a ball very comfortably while the coach rocked and swayed through the night. The 7th Iowa Cavalry next took the stage, galloping and trotting beside it down the trail along the Platte River. The stage stations and the ranches looked as if they had been having a tough time. Most of the ranch buildings were in ruins and abandoned. Many of the stage stations had been burned, and the station men were living in dugouts, some of which were merely holes in the ground, roofed over with a pile of dirt loopholed for rifles. Meals at the home stations were a dollar and fifty cents, cooked by the station agents, brave wives, or by the men themselves. Some of the meals were very poor, too, and some astonishingly good. All went well with the stage until between Cottonwood and Fort Kearney, the driver, who was known as Wopsy, pointed to the south with his whip. There they are, he said quietly, and instantly flung out his flash. The silken snapper cracked like a pistol shot and out launched a team. Down from a low row of sandy buttes half a mile to the south and ahead were speeding a bevy of dark dots. Davy's heart skipped the beat. The dots were making for the trail, as if to cut off the coach. They were Indians, sure. What do we do, Wopsy? asked Finn coolly. Be the men? We'll do the best we can. Six miles to go is all, answered Wopsy in grim manner. And he yelled to the cavalman, You'll have to ride faster than that, boys. The corporal in charge of the squad had spoken gruffly. Three before, three behind, the soldiers were rising and falling in the stirrups and urging on their horses. The grade was slightly downhill, and it was evident that the cavalry horses were no match for the stage team. Six splendid blacks, grain-fed and long-legged. Soon the coach gradually drew, even with the leading soldiers, and began to pass them in spite of their efforts. Can't wait, yelled Wopsy. Goodbye, fact is, he remarked half to himself. I can't hold them. Drat their skins. 
The whoops of the Indians were plainly heard. The breeze was from the south, and as if smelling the red enemy, the stage horses were wild with fear. Grace Wapsy saw it on the lines. His foot pressed to break hard, but he might as well have saved his strength. Wapsy had no time or opportunity to use a gun. His business was to drive. Ben cocked his shotgun lying across his knees. Get in the boot, Dave, he bade. Davy started to slide under, but stopped, ashamed. In a rush, the Indians, whooping and frantically brandishing bows and lances, charged the trail, cutting in behind and racing on both sides before. The cavalry squad were now far in the rear. With a thud, an arrow landed full in the coach side. Another quivered in the flank of the off-wheel horse, and he leaped prodigiously. Steady, steady, boys, he sought Wapsy. The arrows were hissing and thudding. The painted Indians looked like demons. Ben flung up his gun, took hasty aim, and at the report, the nearest Indian on the left, a particularly determined fellow, swerved away, reeling in his saddle pad. Red spots could be seen on his side where the buckshot had struck. At the rear, the cavalrymen were shooting vainly, and suddenly Wapsy gave an exclamation. Take these lines quick, he said. Confound it! An arrow had pinned his right arm to his side. He jerked at it and could not budge it, and Ben grabbed the lines. You take my gun, Dave, he ordered. Don't shoot unless you have to, and then shoot the ponies. Fight them off. Dave promptly seized the gun from Ben's lap, and at once he saw the reason in the last quarter. The Indians were racing on either side. Whenever he raised a gun to aim, every Indian on that side ducked to the opposite flank of his horse and left only a moccasin soul in sight. That was a small mark at which to aim from a jolting coach. Dave aimed and aimed again. Whenever he paused, up bobbed the Indians. When he pointed the gun at them, down they ducked, and all the time they were shooting from underneath their ponies' necks or from the saddle. That's right, fight em off, Davy. It's as good as emptying your gun, panted Ben, hanging hard to the lines. Wapsy was plying the whip now and then to drop it and level his revolver. Fight em off, Davy. A sharp shock almost paralyzed Dave's right arm and through shoulder and arm surged a red-hot pain. He nearly dropped the gun. He glanced at his shoulder and saw a flush of crimson dyeing his shirt, but no arrow was sticking there as he had feared. It was only a gash. All right. Hurt, Dave? queried Ben. No, not much, said Davy firmly. We'll make it, uttered Wopsy. Got to. Fight him off, boys. The sandy plains flowed past, another horse had been wounded, and the coach was fairly bristling with shafts. But the gallant team never slackened their furious pace, and suddenly, with a final chorus of whoops and a last volley, the Indians turned and raced away, for yonder, around the turn, appeared the home station. Hmph, muttered Wopsy, those engines are just on a lark. Now I'll get quit of this arrow. The cavalry squad did not arrive until after the coach had left. Another squad escorted it to Fort Kearney, and by the time Atchison was reached, two days afterward, Dave's shoulder was beginning to heal. It doesn't hurt much, really, Ben, he insisted, but he was proud of his wound, the scar he carries today and other scars beside. From Atchison, he and Ben went down to Leavenworth, on the street at Leavenworth, a hand clapped him on the shoulder, fortunately his well shoulder, and looking up, he looked into the face of Billy Cody. End of chapter 23. Read by Carol Sutton, Knox, Pennsylvania, June 20, 2022. Chapter 24 of Buffalo Bill and the Overland Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Donald Cummings. Buffalo Bill and the Overland Trail by Edwin L. Sabin. Chapter 24 
Buffalo Bill is champion. It was not little Billy Cody now, the slender boy whose boots had seemed too large for him, even when he was riding Pony Express. It was Scout Cody, a man with wide, piercing brown eyes, long, wavy yellow hair, a silky, light brown mustache, a pair of broad shoulders above a wiry waist, and an alert, springy step. But he was Billy Cody, after all. He and Wild Bill Hickok had been serving together with the Union Army in Missouri and Arkansas, and now he was at Leavenworth on a furlough from detached duty at St. Louis. He could give Davy only a half hour. Davy heard some of his adventures, and learned also that Mother Cody had gone. What a brave, sweet woman she had been, and that the Cody home in Salt Creek Valley had been broken up. Truly the West was undergoing great changes. Greater changes still occurred in the next three years. Dave entered West Point in June of the next summer, 1865, and for the succeeding two years he studied hard. When he was given his furlough, he spent part of it with General Brown, who, luckily, was stationed at Fort Leavenworth. The two years at the military academy had formed a different boy of Dave. The strict discipline had taught him how to make the most of his time, and the constant drill exercises had straightened him up and trained all his muscles as well as his mind. He felt quite like a man as he shook hands with the general and met his approving eye. One of his first questions to the general, after the greetings and polite inquiries, was about Billy Cody. "'Billy Cody, you say?' laughed the general. "'Haven't you been reading the papers?' "'I'm afraid I haven't, general,' confessed Dave. "'We don't have much time to read the papers at the academy, you know.' "'That's so.' chuckled the general. You don't. But your friend and mine, Billy Cody, has a new name. He's now Buffalo Bill. He's been supplying buffalo meat to the grading contractors on the Kansas Pacific. They need about twelve buffalo a day, and he took the job for five hundred dollars a month. It's been a dangerous business, and he hunts alone out on the plains, with one man following in a wagon to do all the butchering and load the meat. And the Indians are always trying to get Bill's scalp. So far he's outwitted them, and he's been bringing in the meat so regularly that at night when he rides in, the boys in the camps yell, Here comes old Bill with more buffalo, and Buffalo Bill he is. He's been married, too, you know. Oh, has he? And Dave spoke impulsively. I'd like to see him mighty well. You can. The railroad's running trains about five hundred miles west from the river, nearly to Sheridan. And you've got here just in time to go along with us and see a big contest between Buffalo Bill and Billy Comstock, the chief of scouts at Fort Wallace there. They're to hunt buffalo together for eight hours, and the one who kills the most wins a nice little purse of five hundred dollars, gold. Billy Comstock is a fine young fellow, a great hunter, and a crack shot, but I'll back Buffalo Bill. So, thought Dave loyally, would he too. The contest had excited great interest. An excursion for friends of the rivals and for sightseers was to be run clear through from St. Louis. Every army officer and soldier who could leave was going from Fort Leavenworth. Leader of all was General George A. Custer, the famous Boy General with the Golden Locks, as during the war the newspapers had called him, who, with his fighting 7th Cavalry, had arrived at Fort Leavenworth after a summer's campaign on the plains. Of course, everybody in army circles knew about General Custer, the dashing cavalryman, with his curling yellow hair and his crimson tie. Introduced to him by General Brown, Dave blushed and stammered and felt he must cut a very poor figure. It seemed strange that a railroad actually was on its way across the plains. In fact, there were two railroads jutting out from the Missouri River for the farther west. Northward, from Omaha, the celebrated Union Pacific had built clear to Julesburg and was hustling along to Utah at a rate of five and six miles a day. It followed the old overland trail up the Platte and ate the stages as it had progressed. Here at the southward, the Kansas Pacific, or Eastern Division of the Union Pacific, was reaching westward out of Leavenworth for Denver. It followed the Smoky Hill Fork Trail taken by the Hee Haw Express the memorable outfit of Dave's and Billy's and Mr. Baxter's and all, to the Pike's Peak country and the Cherry Creek diggins. 
Yes, it did seem strange to Dave to be riding that trail in a train of cars drawn by a snorting steam engine, and crowded with laughing, shouting people, traveling in an hour a distance that would have required from the Hee Haw Express a day, perhaps. But the Hee Haw Express had not been such a bad experience, after all, and it had been fun as well as work. Gracious, how Kansas had settled! The Salt Creek Valley, people said, was all taken up by farms. The railroad route from Leavenworth down to the Kansas River at Lawrence certainly passed through nothing but farms and settlements, and on up to Kansas to the Smoky Hill Fork at Junction City all the country was farms, 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 punctuated by towns and cities. Along the Smoky Hill Fork Trail a number of new forts had been established, protecting the way for the railroad. First, beyond Fort Riley, which Davy remembered from the time when the Hee Haws passed it, was Fort Harker. Next would come Fort Hayes, and then Fort Wallace, near Sheridan. The train left Leavenworth early in the morning. The run to the end of the track would take about twenty-five hours, with stops for meals. It would appear, from the looks of the country between Lawrence and Junction City, across the river from Fort Riley, that there were no more wild Indians than Buffalo. But westward from Junction City things suddenly changed and when Dave awakened from a brief doze, here were the same old brown plains again, ready for the bullwhacker, the stagecoach, the buffalo, and the Indians. The train was jammed with all kinds of people from St. Louis, Kansas City, Leavenworth, Lawrence, Topeka, everybody having a good time. In the last car were Mrs. Cody and little daughter Arta. Davy had a glimpse of her, a handsome woman with glowing dark eyes. Buffalo Bill had met her during the war, in St. Louis, and they had been married two years now. She and little Arda and General Custer were the main attraction on the whole train. The train was a traveling arsenal. At the front end of Davy's car was a stand containing twenty-five breech-loading rifles and a large chest of cartridges, with the lid opened. The conductor, who people said was an old Indian fighter, wore two revolvers at his waist, and carried his rifle from car to car. Almost every man was armed with some sort of a gun, and all the passengers and train crew were constantly on the lookout for engines and buffalo. As the train roared onward further into the plains, its snorty, busy little engine sounded five short whistles. Out from the windows down the line of coaches were thrust heads. Men who had no gun made a rush for the stand of arms, and grabbed rifles and cartridges. Buffalo, Buffalo! Where? Quick! There they go! Where? Oh, I see them! Mercy, what monsters! There were people aboard who actually never had seen a buffalo. What beards! Are those really buffalo? Shoot! Conductor, stop the train! Bang, bangity bang, bang, bang! Everybody who could get a glimpse poked his gun out of a window and fired. Two big buffalo bulls were racing the train, heads down, tails up, trying to cross in front of it. The rain of bullets had not touched them. One crossed, but the other suddenly whirled on the track and charged the engine. The cowcatcher lifted him high. Davy had sight of his great shaggy shape turning a somersault in the air, and funny enough he looked, too, with mane and tail flying. He landed with a thump. People laughed so that they forgot to shoot again until too late, and gazing back Davy was glad to witness him scramble to his feet, shake himself, and glare after the train and bellow defiance. It struck Dave as rather of a shame to pepper the buffalo from the windows of a moving train, which, he heard, sometimes did not even stop to make use of the meat, but left the carcasses lying for the wolves. Dusk soon settled, so that there was little more shooting. With a stop for water and supper, on through the darkness rumbled the train. The passengers slept in their seats, an uncomfortable way, but they did not mind. Judging from the looks of Ford Harker and Hayes, which were merely log cabins with sod roofs, the cars were the best place. The talk among the passengers was mainly of Buffalo and of the Indians, who had been fighting the advance of the railroad through their hunting grounds and of the match between Buffalo Bill Cody and Scout Will Comstock. As for Will Comstock, the people said that he was a young fellow with the figure of a mere boy and the face of a girl, 
but that no braver scout ever rode the plains. However, Billy Cody seemed to have the majority. He had been making a great record since the war. He had driven stage for a little while on the overland trail. Then he had married, and soon he was scouting again for the army on the Smoky Hill Trail. He had guided General Custer on a dangerous trip out of Fort Harker, and had been guide and dispatch bearer out of Fort Hayes, and nobody except Wild Bill, who was a scout on this line too, was thought to be quite his equal. Almost as famous as Buffalo Bill were his buffalo horse, Brigham, and his rifle, Lucretia. Against these three, Billy Comstock, good as he was, did not stand much show. It was a jolly excursion crowd, this. Soldiers and civilians, city people and country people, residents and tourists, men, women, and some children, all packed tight and bent on seeing the big match advertised to take place between Buffalo Bill Cody and Will Comstock, the other famous scout. Early in the morning the tracks ended about twenty miles this side of Sheridan, and here, on the open prairie, were gathered an astonishing amount of vehicles, animals, and horsemen. The spot looked like a land opening, or a picnic. Davy recognized Billy Cody at once. With a group of army officers, scouts in buckskin, and other horsemen, Billy was sitting on his horse at the edge of the mass of carriages. The train load of excursionists fairly burst from the cars, even climbing out through the windows, and made a rush for the vehicles. Davy forged ahead for Billy Cody. Billy had left his horse, and when Davy saw him next, he was gallantly escorting his wife and little daughter to an army ambulance. As he came back, Dave caught him. Hello, Billy. By thunder. That name sounds familiar, Dave. Well, I'm certainly glad to see you. They gripped hands. As Buffalo Bill, Billy looked older than he had as Scout Cody, even during the war. His face had been bronzed deeper by hard plains riding day and night, and on his firm chin he wore a little goatee. His suit of Indian tanned buckskin was beaded and fringed, and fitted him to perfection. A fine figure of a man he was, too, every inch of him. There was little time to exchange greetings or words. Everything was confusion, and the day would soon pass. Go in and win, Billy. You bet I will, Dave. And with that Billy strode hastily back to his horse brushing by the many hands held out to stay him a moment. The match was to last from eight in the morning to four in the afternoon, if Buffalo could be found. Slim and active, and as picturesque as Buffalo Bill himself, General Custer, from horseback, announced in a loud voice that the spectators were to follow the hunters until the herd was sighted, and then must stay behind so as not to alarm the buffalo, until the shooting had begun. After that they might go as near as they pleased. Buffalo Bill and Scout Comstock led away. Behind them rode the horsemen, chiefly scouts and army officers. A large bunch of cavalry mounts had been sent out from Fort Wallace near Sheridan, for the visitor officers, and Davy, who was almost an officer, was accorded the courtesy of one. So he was well fixed. Trailing the horsemen came the excursionists in the army ambulances, and the old coaches and spring wagons, and even buggies raked and scraped from far and near. Thus they all proceeded across the rolling prairie. The scene resembled a picnic more than ever. Buffalo Bill, the talk said, was riding Brigham, his favorite buffalo runner, and a scrubby-looking horse Brigham was, too, for a hunter and a racer. Billy's gun was a heavy, long-barreled single shot, a breech-loading Springfield army gun of fifty caliber. Will Comstock was apparently much better mounted and better armed. His horse was a strong, active, spirited black, and his gun was a Henry repeating carbine. He himself seemed a young fellow to be chief of scouts at Fort Wallace. His face was smooth and fair, his eyes roundly blue, and his waist was as small as a girl's. Suddenly Buffalo Bill raised his hand, and at the instant the hum of excitement welled from the crowd. There were some buffalo, there, about a mile ahead on the right, a good-sized herd, peacefully grazing. Away sped Buffalo Bill and Scout Comstock and two other horsemen to get to the windward. The two other horsemen were the referees, one to accompany each hunter and keep tab on him. The rest of the crowd followed slowly, so as to give the hunters plenty of time to begin. On and on spurred the group of four. 
they swerved for the buffalo herd, and, separating, as if by agreement, into pairs, dashed into the herd that way. Buffalo Bill and his referee on the right, Scout Comstock and his referee on the left. As soon as the first shot echoed back across the prairie, the cry went up, They're in! They're in! And wildly excited, straight for the field broke the eager spectators. The wagons jounced and bounded, the horses and mules snorted, women screamed, men shouted, and better equipped than those other excursionists, on horseback amidst his army friends, Davy forged to the front. When they arrived the contest was well under way. Scout Comstock had ridden almost out of sight, pelting along and shooting into the rear of his bunch. He had left a trail of dead buffalo, as if he had made every shot count. Buffalo Bill, however, was right there, working by a different system. Evidently he had hastened to the head of his bunch first, and turned them, until now he had them all actually running in a small circle. He was riding around the outside in an easy lope on Brigham, and steadily firing, off times without raising his gun from across the saddle horn. Brigham's bright lines were hanging loose. He needed no guiding. He knew just what was to be done. He loped to the side of a buffalo and stayed there a moment until the gun went bang. Then even before the buffalo had fallen, he loped on to another, put his master in good position, and at the report of the rifle continued to the next. A wonderful horse, a wonderful horse, ejaculated General Brown. Why, teach that horse to shoot, and he wouldn't need a rider. Bill could sit and look on. He nurses the buffalo together, and all Bill has to do is to load and fire. He scarcely needs to aim, said another officer. Presently Buffalo Bill had shot down every buffalo in the bunch. There were thirty-eight, dead as doornails. When Bill Comstock returned, his horse blown, from chasing his bunch as far as he could, his referee reported twenty-three as that count. The horses were rested until another herd appeared. Out of this, Buffalo Bill killed eighteen with the help of Old Brigham, and Billy Comstock killed fourteen. So at noon the score stood, Buffalo Bill and Brigham, fifty-six, Billy Comstock, only thirty-seven. Luncheon was spread out on the prairie by the excursionists, and everybody ate. The opinion was that Buffalo Bill had won. Billy Comstock never could catch up, not even if they traded horses. After luncheon, Buffalo Bill suddenly stood, and, going to Brigham, quickly stripped him of saddle and bridle. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' announced Billy, "'in order to give my friend Comstock a chance, I'm going to finish my hunt without saddle and bridle, and even then I'll wager I'll down more buffalo than he will.' "'Oh, Mr. Cody, please don't,' begged one of the women excursionists, who had been nervous all along. "'You'll certainly be hurt.' Buffalo Bill smiled and shook his head. "'There's not the slightest cause for alarm,' he said. "'I've ridden this way many a time. Old Brigham knows as well as I what's to be done, and sometimes a great deal better.' Riding thus without saddle and bridle, out of the next herd Buffalo Bill, so cleverly guided by Brigham, easily killed thirteen more buffaloes. The last he drove with a rush straight toward the spectators, and laughed as he downed it almost at their feet. Slipping from his bare back seat, he doffed his hat and bowed. "'You see?' he bade. Scout Comstock came in with a count of only nine. "'I'm done,' he said frankly. "'How many in all, Bill?' Sixty-nine. Forty-six, Hare,' and he shrugged his slender shoulders. "'Well, Bill, you're a wonder.' There's not another man on the plains could have done it. Ladies and gentlemen, he called, three chairs for Buffalo Bill Cody, the boy extra, the kid express rider, the champion buffalo hunter, and the best man that ever rode the plains. The excursion train returned that night, and Davy returned with it. But Buffalo Bill stayed out on the plains, scouting for the army against the Indians. Davy kept track of him, for the name of Buffalo Bill dispatch bearer and guide was constantly in the papers when in june 1869 davy graduated from the military academy and soon was assigned to the fifth cavalry in nebraska buffalo bill had been appointed by general phil sheridan as chief of scouts to serve with it this spring the union pacific railway had met the central pacific railway in utah and the tracks joined 
the overland trail had been spanned at last by iron rails but there was still much work to be done to make the plains safe for the settler his home his church and his schoolhouse and helping to do it dave and buffalo bill often rode together man and man end of chapter twenty four end of buffalo bill and the overland trail by edwin l sabin